Hello. Welcome to Comparing JVM Web Frameworks. To start out, what I'd like to do is learn a bit more about you. So how many people are currently doing web development? OK, how many people are not? All right, that's a better question. Uh, is anyone using Java EE? OK, that's about 60% of the room. Is anyone using Grails? About half the room. Uh, Spring MVC, that's the other half. Uh, is anyone using Wicket? We got two guys. Anyone using Ruby on Rails? Nope. Anyone using Tapestry? Has anyone tried Play? Okay, that's about five people. Is there anyone that came for a particular reason and would like to say it? I got to ask when I when I talk internationally because in the U.S. there's always like ten people who want something specific. So, is anyone here to find out why JSF is the greatest web framework? <laughs> All right, that's good. So I'll tell you a bit more about me now. My name is Matt Rabel. I've had uh, some pretty good gigs in the last few years. I've worked as a UI architect for LinkedIn, for Time Warner Cable, um, for Evi.com, and uh, Overstock.com. I've also worked on a number of open source projects. I'm a committer on Struts 2, even though I haven't really done much with that project. Um, Apache Roller is a blogging project I work on, and my AppFuse project that helps people get started with a lot of these web frameworks. But more importantly, I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana, no electricity, no running water for uh, 16 years, and I had to walk to the bus stop two kilometers per day, and yes, it was uphill both ways. And uh, when I'm not hanging out with my fiance Trish, I'm skiing, mountain biking, or uh, golfing, and uh, being a dad and restoring an old 66 bus, putting a Porsche engine in it. So hopefully someday it looks like that. So uh, today I'm here to talk about web frameworks. The problem with web frameworks um, and basically how I've come to help people choose web frameworks um, with my very controversial matrix that you may or may not, may not like, um, as well as talk about some other ways that people have compared web frameworks. And then uh, at the end, I'll, I'll have some conclusions and hopefully some time for some Q&A. Um, but if not, feel free to contact me on Twitter or send me an email and I can answer questions that way. So one of the problems that we have with Java web frameworks and the Java ecosystem is that there's just so many choices. Um, Stripes was one of the early web frameworks that really inspired a lot of the annotations and simplicity in Spring MVC and Ruby on Rails was the same way. So when people come to Java land, or if they're Java developers and they have to start a new project, often there's just so many choices. Um, and the question is, is there too many choices or is there too much debate? And I think what we've come to in the last few years is the real problem is there's just too many great frameworks. So you have to choose between a Ferrari and a Lamborghini and a Bugatti Veyron. Oh darn. It's like, you know, first world problems kind of thing. So I think the real problem now is too many great choices. So how do you choose between all these various frameworks? And the thing that I found with a lot of my clients is the easiest thing to do is eliminate rather than include. So people always try to get their frameworks into this talk. Um, anyone using ZK? So the ZK folks actually sent me like a five or 10 page paper about why ZK should be in here. And I did this talk earlier this week in Sweden, and the audience was probably two or 300 people, and there was one guy using it. So that pretty much answers why it's not in this talk. But I've you know, used my own criteria to exclude that one from any evaluations that I do. But the reason I think that people are so hesitant 
on choosing a web framework and why this is such a popular topic is because they might have made a bad choice at one time. And so the easiest thing to do is to not choose struts. And this is struts one, not struts two. Um, and for that matter, you might not want to choose JSF. And so this is a graphic from 2004, Craig McClanahan basically saying, hey, I've got a new way for you to write web apps. And uh, we had struts and we had Maverick at the time and web work in spring. And uh, there was this new thing, JSF. So the biggest problem that JSF had in the real world was that Ruby on Rails was released at the same time, as well as Spring 1.0. And this is one of my favorite slides. This is Craig McClanahan, the guy who invented struts and was a spec lead on JSF 1. And he basically, in 2007, sends this email to the struts developer mailing list and says, oh, by the way, I don't do any of that crap that I created anymore. I develop in Rails. And the reason is because I don't have to build or deploy anymore. And I think we've seen that with modern web frameworks that now that step has mostly been eliminated with Rails, with Ruby on Rails, and even with Play. Um, and people are using JRebel more and more with Spring MVC to kind of get rid of that step. Um, so Craig McClanahan, the guy who invented this stuff, the guy who told us for five years that these were the best things since sliced bread, all of a sudden is saying, I wouldn't use it if I were you. I would go and use this other stuff. And then we have the father of Java, James Gosling, on JSF. And at 47 minutes into this YouTube video, he basically says, I hate JSF with a passion. Did anyone see this on Twitter? So we got a couple people. Um, it was basically you know, a great quote that was very accurate. And so this was from a Silicon Valley user group meeting where you know, a bunch of people went and saw him talk. And he continues on after that and says, so Microsoft had this thing called ASF, and they go on a marketing campaign and say, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and if your answer is that's stupid, there's a better way to do that, and blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously, ASF, has anyone used that technology? No. So he meant ASP, and he meant JSP, not JSF. So it's still a great quote, but he certainly doesn't hate JSF. He hates JSP. So when I first started doing this talk, I did it in 2000 for uh, Apache Con in Las Vegas, and I just talked about the web frameworks that I had used. And I talked about how to choose a web framework in 2006. And in 2006, I talked about different application types. So you might have an intranet application that's more of a rich desktop application, and you might use a component-based framework for that. And so what I decided is, you know, rather than using that, I'll go to the community and talk to them and see what they think is a good idea in 2010. So this is last year. I'm getting ready for a talk at DevOps in Antwerp. And I came up with basically a few things. And this is my list in the beginning. Developer productivity. I thought it was important that you could you know, make a change, refresh your browser, and see that change in your browser. I thought that developer perception was important. Because has anyone tried JSF? Keep your hands up if you like it. Exactly. So all hands went down. I've, that's only failed like once, and like half the hand stayed up, and it was awkward. Um, but learning curve, I think, is important as well. And the reason I say this is because um, I've tried Tapestry a fair amount, and I keep having to relearn it because they keep rewriting it every you know couple of releases. But at the same time, even Tapestry five, even though they use conventions and it's supposedly a lot simpler, now I got to memorize like ten new annotations that they keep adding. Um, project health, I think, is important. This is largely um, in the face of struts. Um, and even struts too, because you've seen like Spring MVC kind of keep taking off and more and more people use it, but struts it seems to have kind of dwindled. There's still like tons of downloads, um, and if you go look at like the raw stats of it, I think it's doing very well, but you just don't hear about it much like on blogs and on Twitter and in the community anymore. Developer availability, this is one of those things that companies think is important. Uh, and this is because they want to hire a Wicket developer, they want to hire a Grails developer, they want to hire a Ruby on Rails developer. What they don't realize is they should just hire good developers, and they could probably learn a framework if it's easy enough to learn. Job trends, that's something that people, when they learn a framework, might want to actually you know, get a job doing it. And then there's a, there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's templating, components, Ajax, plugins, add-ons, scalability. So it ended up with like this you know, list of 20. And uh, multi-language support, which is important for maybe two people. The um, rest of the people don't really care. Um, Quality of documentation and tutorials, I think, is very, very important. And we're seeing this more and more as frameworks like Upgrade, 
Um, it's a big problem for struts. It's a big problem for play now. Um, I don't think Rails has a problem because they're pretty good backwards compatible. Um, but you know those frameworks that take something that you know worked one way in 1.0 and works a totally different way in 2.0, it just sucks as a developer to search for that stuff on Google and not be able to find the 2.0 stuff. So uh, you know that can certainly hurt your framework. And then REST support. This is becoming more and more important. Not only just being able to produce JSON and XML, but also from your backend being able to consume it from other resources. The whole OSGI thing, as far as I'm concerned, kind of failed. Um, anyone using that? Nope. So um, not getting much traction. And so you know, I think REST is more of you know, having those disparate systems that can talk to each other, and that's really succeeding well. Um, and then I had to put iPhone support on here just so I could ding Flex. And uh, that seems to work out pretty well because Flex isn't around so much anymore. Is anyone actively developing in Flex? We got one guy, and he loves it. Do you love it? I love it. He loves it. Nice. So what I came up with, and the reason I came up with this was largely because I worked for a client where we did a bunch of Ajax frameworks. And they needed a way for us to say, hey, here's what we looked at for these frameworks, and we want to choose one that best you know, represents what we're doing. So I came up with this comparison matrix. Some people love it, some people hate it. And it basically says, here's all these 20 criteria, and then for these frameworks, I'm going to give it a 0, a 0.5, or a 1. And the 0 means basically doesn't work very well, 0.5 means works OK, and 1 means works really well. And so you'll look at that and say, man, I can barely see that, I can barely read it. And the reason is because it's not really that important, it's just what I think. And you know, a lot of this stuff is more about what you think and what works for you. Um, but for instance, books published. Um, you'll see you know, Struts 2 has a bunch, Spring MVC has a bunch, so they both get a 1. Um, Wicket's only got a couple, so it gets 0.5. Um, some don't have any. Um, they aren't listed up there. But then we get iPhone support, we go over to Flex, and it uh, gets you know, a 0. Um, things of that sort, the developer productivity at the top. Um, some of them get a 0.5 just because of JRebel and allows them to reload a lot of that stuff. Um, but GWT and Grails um, works most of the time, and you, know, you can reload it and see your changes right away. And so I took that, um, put it out there, and then you know, ranked them based on just those ratings. And uh, I am biased. I tend to like the request-based frameworks a lot better than the component-based frameworks. The reason for that is I've believed for the longest time that components should be UI components, right? And that's what Tapestry and that's what Wicket did was they said, hey, we have these grids, we have these menus, and you know, these are your components that you want to use. Well, at the same time, when those came out, and when those got popular, so did Ajax. And so I've always been a web developer more so than a Java developer. And I've always thought that you can invent or you know, create a lot of those components just with JavaScript. And so I think you know, request-based frameworks with JavaScript works pretty well. And so I am biased. And you can kind of see this in my results where you know, Grails is at the top, Spring MVC is second, and Rails and GWT is, you know, third and fourth. And even GWT, I worked with it for a year, so obviously I'm biased, and, you know, I liked it during that time. Interesting thing about GWT is I never liked Swing, and I never liked to develop in that style of, you know, development, and I've always been a web developer, but, you know, using GWT and seeing how easy it was to create, you know, rich UIs and talk to the back end and stuff, I really grew to like it. So we take all those and you know, we put them in, here's our top six. Grails at the top, like I said, GWT, Ruby on Rails, Spring MVC. And Baden crept up there, and that's basically you know, similar to GWT. You write your UI in GWT, and then the back end, you write in Java as well, and it handles all the communication between them. And then Tapestry and Wicket. So all of these are really nice frameworks. And you can just kind of tell my bias, because I like the request-based ones, that those are at the top, and the component-based ones are more at the bottom. And so the interesting thing about us doing this with Ajax frameworks for this client out in LA was they, and this happens with a lot of companies, had already chosen their framework before we got there. But they didn't really know that. They just wanted people to come in and you know, talk about the ones that we wanted and you know, use them and develop them for a week long. Are you guys hearing the feedback off this back there? Or is that just me? All right, I'll keep going. Um, so what they, what they did is they took our weighting of these AJAX frameworks, and you can do this with this one as well, and basically by changing the weights on this, you can make whatever framework you want be the top one. 
you can say, hey, iPhone support isn't important to me. I'm going to go ahead and you know, change that weight to zero. Uh, the number of books published is really important, so I want that to be higher. I'm going to hire a lot of really ignorant developers that need to learn this. And you know, job trends, well, yeah, I want to hire or I want to you know, have my developers leave my company as soon as they learn this. So you can change it so your web framework is at the top. And that was what they did out at this company, which is funny because it was Evite. And they hired us, and we ended up choosing GWT. And the reason for a lot of that was because of like their developers, were Java developers. And so there was four of us that were you know, pretty senior Java developers. I was really the only web developer in the crew. And, uh, and two guys did the back end, and they ended up writing in Grails. And me and another guy did the front end. And as we worked more and more with our developers, what happened? Um, they ended up firing their developers because they weren't that good. And then what happened? They hired web developers. And then what happened? The web developers didn't want to use GWT, so they rewrote it all in jQuery. So choosing your web framework a lot of times you know, might not live throughout the end of the year, but you know, there, are, there are good options out there. So you know, if you do that, then I ended up with these weighted results. And again, my weights back on this slide were just me saying, hey, Books published doesn't matter. Degree of risk doesn't matter. I don't even care if there's another release of the project. Um, internationalization doesn't matter. And uh, templating, I don't really care about. And jobs and developer availability, I don't care about. So I tweaked it and uh, pretty much got the same thing. Grails is still up there. Spring MVC is still up there. Ruby on Rails, Vaadin. Oh, and now Play is up there because you know, that somehow appealed to me and then GWT. And so the interesting thing for me, you know, playing around with these rankings and getting input from the community and sometimes very controversial input, is that everyone seems to be fighting for fifth place. So I first did this talk, um, or the most recent one was at DevOps 2010. Um, Wicket and Struts were fighting for fifth. GWT, Rails, Spring MVC, and Grails were all at the top. Um, I did it a month later at the Rich Web Experience. Grails, GWT, and Rails, and Spring MVC. Tapestry and Vodner at the bottom. Server Side Java Symposium, three months later. Same thing, but Vaadin's, you know, got the clear lead, and that's just because, like, the lead developer from Vaadin keeps, like, sending me emails and spamming me, basically saying, come on, needs to be higher. And so, you know, he had some points there. I did a little project with it, and, you know, learned some more about it, and, you know, got a little more appreciation for it. So what I had to do is there was so much controversy from basically people saying your matrix sucks that I had to document my reasons for giving it a 0 or a 0.5, or a one, and I have some examples. For instance, developer perception. Um, I mentioned that with JSF. There's not that many people are happy with it. If they are, they probably wrote a book or they work for Oracle. Um, learning curves, struts two, spring MVC, pretty easy to learn, and they were for me, um, but they might not be for other people. Um, Wicket, JSF, and Tapestry, um, you got to know a little bit more than just Java web development. Um, talking about Ajax, that one's interesting because I think baking in Ajax to your framework isn't exactly a good thing because often when you do that, um, for instance, with Tapestry, you get stuck with Scriptaculous and Prototype. And now finally they're upgrading to jQuery, but you know, for a long time people were kind of stuck with what was baked in there. Um, and so you, know, you can read all these on my website. I created a Google Doc for it. You can go to that blog entry and read it if you really care. But a lot of times you know, they're just my opinions and they are controversial. So I got some good reactions from it. One of the best ones is from David Pollock, who's uh, the Lyft web developer, the lead developer of Lyft framework. Is anyone using Lyft? We got one guy. Do you like it? OK, I went to a Scala meetup in Stockholm like two nights ago. And these are Scala developers that you know, should like it. And we had like 10 people raise their hands and be like, I've used Lyft. Keep it up if you like it. They all went down. So this is one of those things that as a Java developer, I often heard that, you know, hey, Scala is great mostly because of Lyft, and turns out not so much. But this guy thinks so, so maybe. Um, but what he said is, hey, Matt Scale is 0 to 1, and my ratings are on Matt Scale, except mine goes to 11. So developer productivity, Lyft gets an 11, Rails gets a 5, most Java frameworks get a 1. Um, developer perception, every web framework gets a 1. That's because you should love what you're using, right? Um, learning curve, Lyft gets a 2. Um, I don't know why, um, but job trends, yeah, there isn't any. Are you actually using Lyft in production? Nope, but you know, it's fun to play around with, right? Um, Peter Thomas is another big critic of my JVM web frameworks, um, for good reason, because he's a Wicket fan. 
and Wicket's always a bottom feeder at the top five, so you know he's got to try to defend it. Um, Seam and JSF, he did a performance comparison between those in 2009 between Seam 211 and Wicket 135, and basically tested average response time when you're doing various things. So I know this is hard to read, but a login action with 20 users for Seam and JSF um, took 747 milliseconds. Um, with Wicket, it was 63. So a magnitude faster. Um, and then what he found was on the Seaman JSF side, 20 sessions take up about 800K each, adding up to around 16 megs. On the Wicket side, they only add up to 1.5. If you were using Spring MVC, probably be zero. Right? But he never adds that in there. He never tests the frameworks that he doesn't like. Um, so there's lots of banter between Peter and the Seam developers. And if any of you know Gavin King, whenever you can read a thread from him on any sort of forum, it's always entertaining. So um, if you're looking for some entertainment this afternoon, I invite you to go click on that link and read that. It's some pretty good banter between Peter and the Seam developers. And then Peter added uh, Grails and Tapestry to his mix. So he's starting to get into the request-based frameworks with Grails, um, but still doesn't seem to want to go to the Struts or the Spring MVC guys. So he found that Grails was far more productive than Tapestry 5. He found that Grails still has some ways to go in terms of performance, um, but overall Wicked is fastest, and uh, he's biased again, um, but Tapestry coming in a close second. So the best thing that Peter did is he actually put this information out there in an open source project. Um, it's still out there. Anyone could go take that, you know, add a new framework, and basically do some performance comparisons. So when I came, or when I got ready for you know, this tour of both Sweden and Spain, I decided that, okay, I'm going to do something different with my JV Board Frameworks talk, and instead of doing this matrix that people don't like, I'm going to go ahead and do a bunch of performance testing on my AppFuse project and see you know, if I can make these various frameworks fall over and what it took for the various ones and see you know, how much they can handle on a user load. But then what I found is someone already did this. So did anyone go to DevOps and see this talk on the worldwide wait? Okay, so this will be good information for you. You can actually watch this on parlays. I'm not sure how much it costs, but um, it shouldn't be too much. It's probably cheaper than going to a conference. Um, and it was done by Stan Fondeninden and uh, a couple other guys. One was a JSF fan. Um, I don't know if he worked for Oracle or what, but he, he called himself a fanboy. And uh, it's basically a performance comparison of Java Web Frameworks. Um, and what they did is they said they took my talk from DevOx last year and said, OK, we're going to take the top frameworks that Matt says, and we're going to performance test those. So they chose GWT, Spring MVC, um, JSF, Wicket, and Vaden. And uh, I don't know how JSF got in there. That wasn't in my top five. Um, but probably JSF fanboy guy said, you know, I want to test this and you know, see how it holds up. So they used both Mahora, which is a reference implementation, and my faces. And what they found was just you know, developing the sample application that they were going to use to do this testing, they found that JSF, particularly the Mahora instance, um, only required 121 lines of code. Not much code to actually create you know, that application. But the Wicket one took 332. Um, Spring was similar to JSF where it didn't take a whole lot, 127 lines or 137 lines. But then the GWT version took 637 times, or 637 lines of code. So basically four times C ones. Um, they gathered 16 gigabytes of data. And they ran tests, performance tests with JMeter and Selenium for 700 hours. So this is basically a month's worth of testing just constantly running. And what they found was that um, it's much cheaper to run GWT and Spring MVC. So from a performance standpoint, um, JSF and Wicket would basically fall down after 50 concurrent users. And they couldn't handle any more load. Um, and they'd get out of memory errors and things of that sort. Um, and they found a huge difference between JSF, the Mahora instance, and MyFaces. And even prompted the MyFaces developers to do a bunch of performance enhancements and reduce their memory usage by 20%. And that was between Java 1, which is like late September, and you know, November for DevOps. Um, but what they also found is that they couldn't actually knock down any web framework if they kept a database in the mix. So, you know, these web frameworks typically might not be your bottleneck. It's probably going to be your database, and you need to fix that first before you even need to worry about your web framework. So, you know, adding caching and maybe moving to a NoSQL store. 
But the real reason I like this presentation is because of the comment on Prezi. So Prezi is where this is hosted. You can go read it if you go to that URL. And there's this guy here that comments, hybrid Java beats JSF Wicket in Spring MVC for performance. So I was like, wow, I should probably look into that project, maybe add it to the mix. Really? Do I want to use that after seeing a home page like that? So I decided not to add it. You guys can go look into it if you want. Is anyone using it? No. Still haven't found anyone that's using it. So we could talk about the pros and cons of each web framework. We could talk about how no one wants to learn Groovy in order to learn Grails. I worked on a project for Time Warner Cable where they had a bunch of cold fusion developers. And I started out as the lead architect, like, you know, developing this new online video site. And everyone that was there um, had no interest in learning Groovy to learn Grails, to do Grails. And I was like, it's so much simpler than Java. Let's do that. And they said, nope, we want to learn Java. Why? Because they could get jobs. And they didn't like working at Time Warner Cable. So they wanted to use this project to learn new skills to get a better job. And Groovy basically didn't do it for them. And even what I found was that there was no Groovy books at the time or Grails books that would teach someone that was a web developer how to develop with that framework. They would teach Java developers how to do it, but it really didn't target your average web developer. Um, we could talk about how web developers don't really want to learn GWT to write their JavaScript. So this appeals to Java developers, but not web developers. Um, we could talk about how Java developers are afraid of a framework um, that doesn't scale, even though it powers Twitter.com. Um, we could talk about how Spring MVC is the new struts, and uh, it's used everywhere. And when a framework becomes that permeated and that widely used, there's bound to be one that comes in and knocks it out. Um, we could talk about how Vaden has taken over the world, or we can talk about how awesome Wicked is for web developers, or how Tapestry tries to do everything themselves and they don't like you to use Spring. Um, or we could talk about a bunch of pretty graphs. So we could talk about the lines of code in AppFuse Lite um, for Tapestry and for Wicket hardly has any JavaScript, for, for, but for the other frameworks it has a ton. We could talk about the amount of Java code for all those frameworks is about the same. Um, we could talk about the jobs on Dice, how uh, you know, Ruby on Rails has a whole bunch of jobs. And do you really want to compete with a bunch of other developers? It might be better to actually have no jobs, and then you're the only guy that knows it. Or we could talk about LinkedIn skills. Everyone knows Rails and Spring and GWT and Grails, um, but Tapestry, Wicked, Vaden, and JSF are actually less used skills. And that just puzzles me that J JSF basically isn't you know, known by a lot of people, but maybe they've heard my talks before. We could talk about the pretty graphs on Google Trends and how basically Ruby on Rails did very well in 2004 up to 2005 and 2006, and it's on a trend downwards. Or the GWT got used a whole lot in the beginning and again is trending downwards. But then you look at Grails and it's trending upwards but kind of flat. Um, Spring MVC steady upwards and actually below Grails, which is surprising. Or VOD and how it's actually creeping up on Spring MVC. We could talk about Grails, GWT, um, and Ruby on Rails being very popular on Indeed.com. But if you look at the right, what are the top ones? HTML5, MongoDB. So learning web frameworks might not even get you the next job. And if we look at the relative growth against each other, you can see that GWT has actually grown more than Grails. And, uh, and Ruby on Rails is actually below both of those and the growth factor over the last couple of years. And then if you take out those really popular web frameworks and you look at just you know, the bottom feeders, basically, um, you can see that play is becoming more and more popular and more and more people are hiring for it. And then you add struts in there, and holy cow, people are still using that. And it's growing. That's strange. But again, it's tough to you know, separate struts one and struts two. Um, and then if you add in you know, Ruby on Rails, um, against struts, really, it's not even close. Um, and then you get into PHP, and holy cow, I mean, it's not a web framework. It's more of a language, but still, it's definitely beating a lot of the Java web frameworks. And then you add in .NET, and, you know, it's still way more popular than the Java web frameworks. 
and you add in JavaScript, and you see that it's not even as popular as PHP or Python. And then we get into mailing list traffic. And this one's funny because this is actually from July 2011, and I didn't bother to update it with the latest stats because I like to talk about this one in particular, and that is that when I first did this study and talked about mailing list traffic, the people that said it doesn't matter were the wicket guys. And they said mailing list traffic isn't a good indicator of a project because it basically means that people are having a lot of problems with it or there's a lot of bugs. Now they don't seem to agree with me so much. Um, so I do think it's a good indicator of project health. And I think if you look at some projects, probably like Stripes, you'll see it's just dropped a whole bunch over the last couple of years. Um, so it indicates whether people are using it and asking questions more so that there's issues. Um, there's you know, a ton of books on Rails and Spring MBC on Amazon. But Spring MBC, it's so hard to buy a Spring MBC book. It's easy to buy a Spring book, and you get one chapter on Spring MBC. Um, but luckily, their documentation's pretty good. 2011 releases, um, Grails had you know, one. Um, Baden had 20. Um, there's a company that likes to do continuous releasing, maybe. Um, Spring MBC only had a couple. Rails had uh, six, I think. And then Wicket didn't even have any. Um, we get into Stack Overflow tags. And uh, there's a couple missing spots there. Sorry about that. But you can see that Rails basically dwarfs uh, Grails and Baden in that one. Um, Spring is much more popular than JSF, GWT, Grails, and Wicket. But again, you get that, that thing where it says, you know, hey, it's, is it Spring or is it Spring MVC? So, you know, that's a good question on this slide. Um, and you can also see for all the noise that the Wicket guys make, um, there's actually not a whole lot of people using it compared to the other frameworks. Um, and then you can look at, okay, isn't Scala or Clojure taking over the world and Java's not that popular? Um, not according to Stack Overflow. Um, but if you take out Java and just compare some of those next generation frameworks on there, it looks like Scala is beating Groovy. And then Zero Turnaround did this framework popularity report where they found in a survey of 946 developers that Spring and Hibernate are awesomely popular and in fact are still used more than the standards. However, as far as what frameworks go, JSF looks like a popular choice with 24% of the answers. So in some of my studies, you know, looking at various, you know, tagged and mailing lists and stuff like that, it seems that JSF is actually doing better than I originally thought. Also, it appears that Prime Faces um, is a pretty good library, and if you want to do JSF, you might want to look in that. And uh, there's some good drama right now between Prime Faces and Ice Faces. Apparently, Ice Faces just stole a bunch of code from Prime Faces and put it into their latest implementation. So if you go on InfoQ, you can read about that. Um, but at the same time, it's Apache licensed, so you can actually do that, and uh, maybe they shouldn't complain. Um, but I think what we really need is, instead of all these graphs and you know, this stuff, is a Gartner Magic Quadrant. Then we can group web frameworks into challengers, leaders, niche players, and visionaries. And uh, I think we could actually put um, some of these frameworks into the visionary status. And I know this is hard to believe, so bear with me. But Struts, when it came out in 2001, was very much the killer app for J2E. We hadn't really done much on the server side. We'd use servlets and JSPs, but it was one of the first thing that kind of brought web developers into the ability to be, or Java developers, into the ability to be web developers. Um, and then Spring came along and it innovated um, with EJBs a fair amount, but it really didn't innovate much with the web framework. Sure, it was you know, much easier to use, but if you understood struts, you could probably understand Spring MVC without having to learn a whole lot. Um, it didn't do it like Rails did. Rails came out in 2004, and that really wowed a whole bunch of people. And there was a whole bunch of people that I know that were Java developers that went over to Rails and learn that and continue to be Rails developers. And then GWT, when it was announced in 2006 at Java 1, it was way different. It was way different than anything we had seen before. And whether people like that now is a different story, but you know, it did something that no one had ever done before. And then Play, it's trying to do something similar where it's getting rid of the servlet API. It's you know, having your container embedded within your application. And they're trying to do asynchronous programming for their 2.0 release where you can actually have Facebook style you know, auto updates and Twitter auto updates and sharing documents and allowing you to you know, collaborate with documents with other people at the same time. But with their ditching 1.0 and rewriting everything for 2.0, that's going to be tough to see if that actually works for them. Um, because people are going to search for documentation, not be able to find it, and they're kind of taking out their CRUD module and stuff like that. So 
I think it's going to be a tough sell, and I think the biggest problem they've had is they just said, hey, 2.0 is coming out way too early. They should have actually written it and then talked about it and polished it. Um, so, you know, the interesting thing about all this is I think you need to learn if you're a job developer or a web developer. And this guy, Rich from Atlassian, wrote a great blog post on modern principles in web development. And what he said is his you know, core web development principles are designing for mobile first. So you probably need a mobile app um, for your web app. And if you're developing a new app, develop for mobile first. Build only single page apps. Create and use your own REST API. And sex sells applies to web apps. So make them look good, basically. And then what I discovered is just working with my current client out in California is that there are so many people that are Java developers that call themselves web developers. And they don't like CSS, and they don't like JavaScript, and they don't use it. And so what I've tried to convince people to do or tell people is, hey, if you're going to call yourself a web developer, you should start learning web technologies and using CSS and using JavaScript and growing to like those. If you're a Java developer, chances are you had to learn Java at one point, And these are a lot easier to learn than Java. However, Java still remains, in spite of the fragmented programming space and Scala and Clojure and all those, a viable and growing language. And this was from um, Stephen O'Grady, and he just published this last week. He did a bunch of correlation between GitHub and Stack Overflow to see what people were using and talking about and found that you know, it's still very much growing. So what I think is a modern web developer should embrace JavaScript, is learning mobile frameworks like Sentia Touch, jQuery Mobile, PhoneGap to package those up and run them on an iPhone, or even learning native technologies with Android or with Objective-C. They're probably using HTML5 and CSS3. The reason they can do that is because they can ditch IE6, and they should be able to ditch IE7. Um, and you should be developing REST APIs, or at least using REST APIs. And that's because most people in the internet going forward will likely access the internet via mobile devices, not via desktops. Some people will never know what Firefox is. They'll just know that there's a browser on their phone. Um, so it's a great time to be a web or a mobile developer. So you kind of have to decide, are you a web developer or are you a services developer? And if you're going to call yourself a Java developer going forward, I think you might end up in this realm where you're more of a services developer. And if you want to still call yourself a web developer, well, you might have to learn web technologies. So if you're a web developer, what you get to learn next is about client-side MVC frameworks. And there's a whole bunch of these. And luckily, Paul Hammett, a guy from ThoughtWorks, um, wrote up a blog post on a number of client-side MVC frameworks. Um, Knockout, Spine, a few others are in there. And the funny thing about those is they're, uh, they're innovative in that they allow you to do a lot of your processing on the client, which is one of the principal things of Sophia, service-oriented front-end architecture, where they talk about your services just basically passing back XML and JSON. Um, but at the same time, with JavaScript, you miss a semicolon, and all of a sudden your whole app doesn't work anymore. Right? And so um, they are struggling with that. They're struggling with templating. Um, whereas a lot of the server-side frameworks have figured that out. Um, but at the same time, the reason you want to use a particular web framework is so you can be productive. And that's why you want to use Grails or Play or you know, Spring MVC is because those are the most productive web frameworks. But what Zero Turnaround found is that the real problem is not your web framework. It's the fact that you're spending about 15 hours a week actually writing code. And when you do write code, you're probably spending most of that time multitasking. So a lot of these productivity problems don't really have anything to do with your web framework. They have a lot to do with your organization and you yourself, what you're actually doing while you're on the computer. So the fast web frameworks, the zero turnaround web frameworks, do help because they don't cause you to look and do something else because you know it only takes a couple seconds. Um, but you should try to make you know, anything you do monotask, basically. And then uh, you know, my final conclusion is, I don't think there is any best web framework. Um, there's just a lot of great choices out there. And uh, I don't think you should listen to me. I don't think you should use my matrix. Um, if you really want to and you've got a cool consulting gig, um, maybe try it, because managers will probably like it. Um, but more than anything, you should choose your own. You should try to figure out the features that you want in your application. You should try a few. You should do a spike with them.
and you should, you know, if you want to document and rank them on a spreadsheet, you can certainly do that. Um, but a lot of times what you can do is just pick one and go with a gut feel and you'll probably be successful. Um, a lot of the highest trafficked websites I've worked for and the big companies actually have a web framework that they wrote on their own. And it's crap. And people don't like it. But it works. So your web framework's probably not going to make or break your company. Um, but don't forget, more than anything, sex sells. So make it look pretty. That's all I have. Any questions? Right. And so um, I'm just wondering how do you separate that? Because um, the case study is a big matrix. You have something like Rails. But when I look at the website of Rails, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at CSVs, I'm looking at controllers and things like that. Whereas um, something like PWP or um, Next is more kind of front-end driven. Front-end takes a lot more heavy in front -end. So he's basically asking what the difference is between more service-oriented traditional frameworks, page-based, you know, generating the page on the server side, and the UI frameworks like Flex and GWT. And what I think is there's actually still a lot of space for the server-based frameworks. And there's a lot of documentation sites, and there's a lot of content sites that are going to want to continue to use those, especially for SEO. But you're not going to want to write Wikipedia with GWT or Flex. You want that still, you know, something that grabs a bunch of information from the database and displays it on the page. And we have millions of apps that have been written that still use those technologies. So we're lucky in this day and age if we actually get to write a new app any day of the week, right? I mean, most of the time, maybe you'll get to write a new one once a year. But a lot of us are doing maintenance programming or enhancing existing apps that already use those. So I think going forward, if you can, you try to develop a REST API. And then as far as your, West, your web framework matters or what you're using on the front end, you can use almost anything. And so. What I'm saying is there's a place for both, um, and you probably can't develop you know, two different types of apps with uh, two different types of frameworks. No, I guess my question is, shouldn't you be separating them and using the CSV? Yes, but at the same time, I think a lot of the criteria is, uh, is just stuff that I made up and not that important. Anyone else? Yeah. So he's asking if there's, a, if there's a market for a very simple framework, not so complicated. And I think there is, and I think it's JaxRS. Um, they've even talked about adding JSP support to JaxRS. So that might be it, where you just annotate your classes and you generate your JSON or XML. Um, that's one possibility. Um, but also, I think that web frameworks are like spaghetti sauce. And there's like 100, maybe 200 different spaghetti sauces out there. And everyone wants a different one. It's not like ketchup, where there's like one. And no one wants a different kind of ketchup, right? And so there's no, like, that's why I say there's no best web framework, because it's more like people have different tastes. And sometimes they like the simple one. Sometimes they like Sophia. Sometimes they like more of the page-based, you know, rendering the server-side pages. Anyone else? Well, thanks for coming.